Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, professor of physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of February 10th this time around. It's a terrible moon week. Uh, moon, the moon's about as bad as it can get for washing out things to observe. On the evening of the 10th into the morning of the 11th, it's greater than 90% full. So 97% full, excuse me, almost a full moon. Remember, uh, so it's up all night. You can watch the moon uh, pretty much all week. You can see the moon all, all night. By the end of the week, uh, the moon rises later and later and later each night. And so by the end of the week, you're going to have to wait a little while after dark to see it. Uh, but it's still 80% full uh, at the end of the week. Uh, remember, this happens because there's the sun. And here's the earth. The full moon is out here. New moon is over here. First quarter's third quarter. And so you got the full moon where we can see the entire illuminated side of the moon. Uh, so it's as far away from the sun as you can get. Noon is right there on earth. Midnight is right there. So the, the full moon is, you know, we play with our clocks and stuff and we have time zones and whatnot. But the full moon is more or less directly overhead at midnight. Uh, so it rises six hours before that sets six hours after that. We're at, it's, it's all... This is all approximate stuff. Uh, but anyway, you get this idea that the full moon is out here on the nighttime side up all night, whereas you have these quarter moons, and they're only up half of the night. And so this is, this is what's going on here, because you can only see it, you know, this moon right here, you can only see from the first, um, <clears throat> the first half of the night, the first quarter moon. You can only see the first half of the night, and then it sets. The third quarter moon, you see the second half of the night, and that's why you see it in the morning after daylight for a while. Anyway, this is what we, this is what we were supposed to talk about today. Oh, you, you have a plan. You think, hey, we're going to talk about this thing and that thing, and then you start talking, and who knows what you're going to talk about. Uh, so anyway, uh, on the 11th and the, and the 12th, night of the evening of the 11th, morning of the 12th, again, all night long, 12th into the 13th, the moon's greater than 99% full. We've got a full moon here. And on the evening of the 12th into the 13th, the moon is going to be, uh, it's going to start that night a couple of degrees for me. Uh, it depends where you are in the world as you start observing as it gets dark. But for me, it's going to start a couple of degrees away from the bright star Regulus in the base of the sickle shape, the backwards question mark shape in Leo. So you've got that, that, that head of Leo out there. And that's Regulus is right there. And the moon's going to be within two degrees or so and be pulling away from it as the night goes on, two, three, four degrees. On the evening of the 16th into the morning of the 17th, the end of the week we're talking about here uh, right now, it's a great night to just watch. If you don't watch the moon move against background stars very much and you want to watch the motion of the moon just to appreciate it, how it's moving against the background stars, this is a great night to do it because the very bright star Spica in the constellation Virgo the moon is going to start west of it in the evening, and it's going to end east of it. And it slides within a degree or so of Spica as it goes across there. So it gets pretty close to this bright star Spica and slides across below it there. Uh, great, great night for watching this again. By the time we get to the end of the week, the moon's going to be about 80% full. So not quite as bad as it was for washing out other stuff earlier. Uh, let's think about Mars. Uh, we've been watching Mars in Gemini. There are the bright stars, Castor and Pollux, and there's bright red Mars uh, that looks like this. Now, you can identify some of the other stars in Gemini to watch Mars move as the week goes on. Uh, Iota is there, 3.8 magnitude. Remember, the magnitude system counts backwards. You can, uh, you, you, you can see down to fifth or sixth magnitude, depending on how dark your skies are, fourth magnitude. Uh, in a lot of places, if you don't have real dark skies, maybe worse, if you have a lot, a very not dark skies. But we've got Iota is 3.8 magnitude, Wasat is 3.5 magnitude down here, and um, Absuta is 3.1 magnitude. So all bright, but not terribly bright stars here, that if you've got reasonable skies, you can see it. Mars is in that triangle. And so watch Mars moving. Mars has been in retrograde motion for a while now, meaning it's moving west against the background stars uh, as, the, uh, as night, one night moves into the next night. As we work our way to the end of February here, just a couple of weeks, Mars is going to start forward or prograde motion again. And so Mars is going to start back and uh, going back in the direction that we would typically see it, where it spends most of its time. Remember, this happens as we have the sun up here again. Let's, there's the sun, and there's the Earth, and Mars is down here. 
as we catch up and pass Mars, because we're going faster in our orbit, Mars looks like it's going backward, even though Mars is actually going in orbit that way. We're just going faster that way, like passing a car on the highway. So that's what's been going on, but we're going to get far enough around here now. We're going to start to pull away from Mars. Mars is going to get fainter in the sky. It's not going to look, we're not as close. It's not going to look as big and bright, and it's also going to go back in to uh, prograde motion and move east against the background stars. So watch that over the next couple of weeks. Use these three stars, Mepsuta, Wasat, and Iota Geminorium, to to track the progress of Mars and watch it move back into prograde motion. That'll be great fun. Uh, let's talk about Sirius. The last couple of weeks, we've mentioned Sirius, and we talked about Sirius and Procyon last week. And let's go back there and, and give us some things to observe. We can start right at the beginning of the week, but as the week goes on and the moon rises later and, and actually starts to wane away at the end of the week, it'll be easier to see some of these things. So this is a great late week thing to do. Uh, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, that means Orion is up here. So we got Orion up here on the calendar uh, that we're, we, we would see up that direction. Uh, you drop five and a half degrees. A fist at arm's width is about, uh, at arm's length is about uh, 10 degrees. So about half a fist width, uh, we drop down that way. And uh, Sirius is the alpha star, minus 1.4 magnitude, uh, the brightest star in the constellation. You come to Mirzam, the beta star, 2.0. Big bright star. You'd think, well, that's a bright star if Sirius weren't outshining it by so much nearby like that. Go about the same distance, a little bit less, up the other direction, and you come to the gamma star. Sometimes I look these things up for you and, and figure out, why is this the gamma star? Typically, we think, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule, but we kind of think, well, alpha star is the brightest star, beta star is the next brightest star, gamma star is the next brightest star. But gamma is not bright at all. Gamma is a 4.1 magnitude star, fainter than Omicron 2 we're going to talk about down here, uh, fainter than Delta. Uh, by a lot, and so I, I, you know, I'm not sure what the story is there. I didn't look that up to figure that out. They're about four and a half degrees up. Now, if you go up and you just turn more or less due east and go three and a half degrees, uh, so a third of a fist width, a couple of fingers, uh, two to three finger widths across there, you go due east, you come to a, a pretty nice open star cluster, but not a real bright open star cluster. You probably can see it early in the week if you have a small telescope. Uh, probably not binoculars. I don't know. Um, but as the moon gets further away, it's going to get easier to see. NGC 2360 is that open star cluster. We like to see these open star clusters. I don't know, 50 stars in it. And so you might be able to pull out 50 individual stars in your telescope. Now let's go back to Sirius and drop down this direction up almost, you know, eight and a quarter degrees. So almost a full width, fist width down uh, sort of south and to the east of Sirius. You come to Omicron 2. Omicron 1 is way over here. Omicron 2 is a third magnitude star. Continue on another two and three quarter degrees, that's right there, and you come to the 1.8 magnitude delta, uh, sometimes called Wezen. And so you have the delta star that's down here, a nice bright 1.8 magnitude star. It's getting pretty far south for some of us who live as far north as I live uh, to see, but it's still a relatively easy star to pull out. It's not like it's way down in the haze in the southern horizon if I'm going to do it. So we've got two and three quarters degrees here. We go that same distance up here, and we get to Tau. Uh, Tau, Canis Major Joris. And Tau, you have Tau and another star uh, a little the less than a less than a, about a third of a degree apart from each other. I think uh, you got this sort of, of two fang mark snake bite kinds of stars. Uh, bam, bam, 4.4 and 4.9 magnitude. Good dark skies, you can see them. Binoculars, you pull them right out. But one of the interesting things about Tau, so we're learning our stars of Canis Majoris. And we're, we're finding a couple of interesting clusters we might look at as well. Uh, one of the interesting things about Tau is it's in NGC 2362. This was NGC 2360 up here. This is an open star cluster, and Tau sits right in the middle of it. It's a bright, glittering uh, group of stars. So it's actually hard to tell. Tau itself is a multi part of a multiple star system, but it's really hard to tell where the companions are because there's a lot of uh, relatively bright stars nearby here that is this is a it's a beautiful star cluster and a small telescope they're really good tell really good star cluster for your small telescope so give it a try if you haven't looked at this NGC 2362 sometimes it's called the Tau uh, Canis Majora star cluster and so so sometimes it's named for that star that's right there at the heart of it but see if you can find Tau and its companion over here 4.4 4.9 magnitude getting down at the edge of naked eye visibility for most of us uh, binoculars will surely help you pull that out and a small I, I, maybe binoculars can you can see this open star cluster too but it's a pretty tight open star cluster so a small telescope is going to be better for that uh, so that's what we got on a moon-filled week. Uh, you can watch the moon track past a couple of bright stars. Watch Mars. It's not moving very fast right now because we're about to, we're, we're about to start pulling away from it. 
so that it goes back into prograde motion. So notice that it's not tracking as fast against the background stars as it was. That'll pick up uh, in the coming months as, as it starts zipping away there. And then let's poke around Canis Major, uh, Canis Major just a little bit and see if we can identify these, these two nice open star clusters and some of the stars we don't always pay attention to. That's what we got for you. As always, everybody, thanks for watching, and we hope you have a great observing week ahead. Heck, have a great total week ahead.